one or two more minutes to, to the people that are, that are late and then we'll get started. Thank you very much for your patience. Recording. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Kinza Khaldan, Head of Marketing at uh, Infominio. Thank you for joining this session today. It's our first brainstorming webinar and we are very happy to have you all with us today. Um, this webinar is public, so if you want to invite friends uh, or colleagues, feel free to just share with them the link uh, to this call. Also, the session will be recorded and available on our different um, social media channels. So if you want to rewatch it later, uh, feel free to do that. Let me introduce my co-host. So today we have with us Martin Troukit, who is the co-founder and managing partner at uh, Infominio, and uh, Lorenzo Bruscagli, senior associate and expert in uh, business research. They will both explain what is brainstorming, how we came up with this term, um, the approach and uh, many other aspects covering uh, the topic. Please make sure to ask all your questions using the Q&A section you have on the bottom left or your Zoom screen, and we will answer them at the end of, the, of this session. Um, with uh, no further ado, uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kenza, uh, and welcome everyone to this, uh, this webinar. Uh, Lorenzo and I and, and Kenza are very happy to uh, to have this uh, this session. You'll see uh, a few elements about brain showing. You're going to be uh, among the first in the world to know about brain showing because it's something very new that we've come up with. But we really think that we're onto something, and 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 we want to share that with you. Uh, so we will present a few slides. Don't worry, it's not going to be uh, too much of of slides. We're mostly uh, going to be about explaining what's all about and and we uh, would be very happy to to answer any questions this is just the beginning of a, of a conversation about this topic uh, we we're happy to give you an intro and then the idea uh, and we'll wrap up on this is uh, to expand the concept of brainshoring having more companies recognize them, themselves as brainshoring companies as uh, next step after this webinar so let's get started um so where are we coming from? Why do we think now is the time to, to think about a new concept in, uh, in, uh, in outsourcing? So essentially, we see four uh, main drivers, main changes that have happened and made uh, uh, brain showing possible. First of all, is the availability of talent in emerging countries. Um, the uh, investment in education in emerging markets has been increasing over time. In, most of them, unfortunately, not all of them. And now you have smart, skilled, and well-trained people in, in, in markets, uh, which did not in the past have the same uh, pool of talent. And this is a talent pool that you can tap into. That's number one. Number two is uh, companies uh, and their ability to win in markets. What we've seen uh, in the last uh, few years is that the company's competitive edge relies on one or several functions that are at the core of their differentiation. And they need to focus on this, meaning they need to get rid of some other activities which are important to be done, but do not have to be done internally. You can take an example of, I don't know, Apple, for example. Uh, they are one of the most prestigious companies in the world. They do phones, but they don't manufacture phones. They uh, uh, design them, they sell them, they market them, but they don't manufacture them. They don't believe their competitive edge is in manufacturing. And same goes with services. You do not have to execute 100% uh, internally because you want to focus on what makes the most difference. Third, um, we've seen that in the last two years uh, very much, but, uh, uh, but it was already happening in the past. The idea is that you do not have to be physically sitting next to your colleagues to be able to deliver work, uh, including intellectually challenging. So everybody was thinking that it was possible to outsource things or do at a distance things that were very basic, but as long as it was complex, it was not possible. With COVID, every CEO that I know of was frightened when COVID happened that people started working remotely. And 90% of the people that I talk to today say, actually, I was wrong. I thought it wouldn't work and it does work, including for things that are complex. So now we see that it's possible that the physical presence is not required thanks to 
I guess, the level of empowerment of people, but also the use of technology like we have today. We're sitting in different countries, uh, watching this webinar, and still uh, we can exchange ideas. Fourth uh, is a point around executives. Uh, most of you attending this call are executives. You have a number of things you're supposed to be good at. Uh, and if 20, 30 years ago, you only have a limited uh, tool set available for you on, I don't know, the softwares you could access uh, and so, so on, you could be quite specialized. Today, essentially with a computer, when you're in services, you can do data analytics, you can do research, you can do design, you can do everything. The point is, it's very difficult to juggle between all of these tasks and it's very difficult to be good at everything. And are you asked to be jack of all trades? Uh, yes, but it puts pressure on you. So getting support for some of the tasks that you're not individually uh, amazing ads or that it's not best use of your time is also creating a, a, a momentum for outsourcing of the services in essence point two and point four are linked right a company needs to focus on their competitive edge but same goes with individuals okay so when we see these four concepts we see something that that pleads for outsourcing of certain tasks that are of high value add to emerging markets and it's essentially what brainshoring is about. So the definition that we've come up with brainshoring is it is the offshoring of tasks which require extensive problem solving skills. So it is not about trivial down to earth execution. It's about solving an open ended problem and that require a close collaboration. And these two are very much linked because if something is complex, you need to collaborate closely. We are on a webinar today if I had sent you the slides and say to you, okay, read it, read it, you probably would have an understanding of brain showing that is much less than the fact that we have that interaction and we have that those explanation coming up. Okay. So there's three main characteristics to brain showing. One, it is problem solving, it is open-ended questions. So it is outsourcing still, but it's getting much closer to consulting than anything that came before. It's about getting something that is ambiguous requiring critical thinking second it requires live interaction it requires that we talk that we exchange messages on whatsapp because it's it's about iterating you can't find a solution of something complex by sending one email and that's all you need to interact to exchange ideas to brainstorm and so on and third because it is something that is complex you need to have a relationship being built the expectations of every person are different. When you outsource something and you work with somebody hand in hand, you have to have a level of intimacy with the people that is much stronger than on tax are more transactional. Typically, you need to know the people, know who they are, know their agenda, when you can call them, what channels they prefer, the number of kids they have, and they have the a school run to do at 5 p.m. All these elements will allow you to provide a much better service. So just to, to put things in perspective, what is brain showing, what is not in, uh, brain showing? First characteristics, it's, it is not a transactional relationship. It is not, I want this, give it back to me, thank you and goodbye. On the contrary, it's something where you need a sustained support. Some of the services would be around graphic design, for example. Uh, you need the supplier working with you to know your templates, to have set up the system so they can integrate yours with yours. Uh, they need to know your preferences, the style of design that you that you prefer, and so on and so forth. And that pleads for a relationship that is permanent and in, in the long run. Second, it is not like vertical. I am the client and I'm telling you, you do that and you just purely execute and you obey me. On the contrary, it's more horizontal. I want, I value your critical thinking. I value your expertise. I value your opinion. So it's about a, a live dialogue between the supplier and the client. Third, it is not about pushing paper. It's not a report that you get from a brain showing supplier. It is not what you want is insight, is change. Uh, and we'll ex illustrate with, with Lorenzo some examples that make it more, more concrete and how you interact and the type of deliverable that you get. Fourth, uh, a lot of the outsourcing in the past has been focused a lot, a, a lot on delivery. Okay, I'm gonna execute. It's gonna be a process. Tell me what you need and I'm gonna do exactly as you tell me. On the contrary, in brain showing, I think the approach is critical. It's about intake. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Then it's about 
execution, and then it's about delivery, making sure we close the loop. Does the product or the answer that I give you answer your initial your initial clients? And we'll go into that in more in more details. And finally, there's this notion of asynchronous and synchronous. It's a fancy word, but essentially what it means is it needs live interaction. You can't just send an email to somebody on the other side of the world for them to work during the night and they will send you another email the following day and we'll have solved your problem. It requires that you operate pretty much in the same time zones as your customers to have that interaction, to have those video calls ideally, uh, all these phone calls, all these WhatsApp, whatever, but you need to iterate. And that means that you're in the same uh, at the same time. By the way, one point that I think is important is it's not just working at the same hours, it's working in the same time zone. Working at the same hours might mean that you outsource your work to somebody that is working during the nights on the other side of the world. But frankly, I don't know about you guys on this, uh, on this uh, webinar, but 2 a.m. in the morning, I'm not in the best of shapes and I'm not capable of taking uh, this type of problem. So it really requires that like vertical division of the world with three main regions, and we'll get back to that, the Americas, EMEA, and APAC. So now, brain showing, as you understand, it's about people. It's all about people. Yes, you have a little element of methodology, you have other elements, but it, it's about mostly about the people and the active talent. So what do you uh, look for in the people that you hire when you want to do brain showing? First of all, you want intellectual flexibility. You want smart people and people that are open-minded, creative, and so on. So you can see that it's quite different from other outsourcing activities, where on the contrary, you value more discipline and rigor and the ability to follow process and instructions. Here, you value people that have critical thinking. Second, you value the languages. I'm doing this webinar together with Lorenzo in English, but if I were speaking in French, I would be better. My, my level of French is better. And, and, and to do research when you want to find information, for example, when you speak to people on the phone, if you speak to them in the native language, you get more information. And again, it's not black or white, but you're getting closer. You're increasing your level of quality on the interaction with your clients, potentially your ability to source information, your ability to do your work if you speak multiple languages. It's about creating activities. It's about having ideas. It's about finding several possible approaches to solving a problem. <clears throat> if you just always apply the same methodology, the same approach, you will probably not get great results. And in a lot of cases, you will be working on problems that are complex, that are difficult. The client probably has tried it already and failed at it. And what you need to come with is Okay, solution, why I'm going to try that. But I'm also ready to try that other solution and other solution and then, then, and then uh, that other solution. So it requires that you are uh, creative. Another point is about the management of expectations. In services, essentially, a happy client is not a client for whom you've done amazing work. Um, and a happy client is uh, a client with expectations at a level and you delivered beyond expectations, the ability to manage expectations, to only promise things that you think are realistic uh, is, is critical. And that requires a level of maturity and that horizontal uh, um, uh, you know, approach that we discussed before. If you're just here to say yes, sir, and execute, you will probably not be able to manage expectations for the client properly. On the contrary, if you position yourself as a peer, you say, okay, my goal is to make you as happy as possible. I think this is feasible. I think this is very challenging. I can spend some time, but be aware that maybe it will not yield the results that you're looking for. And finally, uh, communication is critical. Again, with all these factors of being synchronous, of iterating, of being creative, it really requires an ability to exchange ideas that is, uh, that is, that is very good. Uh, so you need people that are good communicators. So now let's move on to the brain showing approach and I'll uh, hand over the mic to Lorenzo. Thank you, Martin. Uh, hello, everyone. So as uh, Martin explained, um, brain showing is really built on a three-step approach. It's not, uh, we're not solely focused as brain showers just on executing or just delivering uh, on a task where uh, we're focusing on uh, solving problems. And in order to do this, we have to take a holistic approach uh, to each project and task uh, with our client in an open and transparent way. So uh, the first step, uh, which is uh, the intake, is where I believe, you know, from my own personal experience, is where we can actually add the most value. The intake phase 
is where is the opportunity that we brain, you know, uh, as brain shoring uh, so, uh, providers have to understand the question, understand what the problem is. Um, and uh, then we, uh, once we have a clear understanding of what the context of the problem, what the ultimate question is that, uh, that, that the client is working uh, to solve, we can start to defining, uh, start on defining uh, the type of deliverable that uh, would best uh, resolve this type of question. This can be, you know, uh, a vid, if it's, uh, if we're talking about graphic design, it can be a, a video versus instead a, um, an infographic campaign, or in the case of research, you know, we can de uh, determine whether, you know, the, uh, the problem will be better served via a simple Excel spreadsheet or, or PowerPoint. Uh, and this, in fact, is how we design a customized approach. So an example of the intake phase could be uh, that a typical question that, you know, uh, we can often get in the realm of, uh, of research is a, a client will ask us to maybe do a benchmark of uh, uh, X numbers of companies in, um, um, uh, it, let's say, in the chemicals field for, uh, for, uh, for four countries. Uh, as a brain shore, that's fine, but then uh, what I will want to understand is why do you need uh, these, type, uh, these types of benchmarks? And through that conversation, maybe some of uh, it could emerge that the client is actually working on, on, on preparing an M&A proposal strategy uh, for, um, uh, for the company. So then we can start to establish, okay, if you need an M&A strategy, then we need to look at certain financial performances, whether they have been uh, um, whether already subsidiaries or not. And so we can start to elaborate more on the original question. And, uh, and then finally, uh, because we have that relationship, uh, that permanent uh, relationship with the client that Martin explained earlier, we know already basically, we, we can already anticipate the type of deliverable that, um, uh, th that will be preferred. For, uh, for, for this type of task. So it's all about, so the, the theme though, uh, the main point is that in the intake phase, we can understand the problem and customize, uh, and customize the approach. That finally, uh, that leads us then to the execution phase, uh, critically important, of course. Um, so it's, uh, of course, you know, we, uh, the, the type of people that are involved in brain shoring uh, need to be critical thinkers and, uh, excellent uh, in their fields, but we have. But what brainstorming offers is a um, is a crucial advantage is that live interaction with the client. So the best way to leverage brainstorming uh, capacities is to establish a thought partnership between the client and the provider. So when uh, so that there is this uh, horizontal, transparent communication uh, between the two. And, um, and uh, this includes obviously providing uh, 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 updates on, you know, on a regular basis. That is uh, very important from expectation uh, management. Ultimately, we want to be able to deliver a product that is not a surprise uh, to the client. And, um, and, but even most importantly is that we can iterate our approach. We can change, uh, uh, we have the opportunity thanks to that live interaction to change the approach or to modify uh, the sources or modify the deliverable according uh, to the new information that may uh, come out during the course of the project. Um, and so, and, uh, and, Especially, this is allows us uh, to access different types of, uh, of tools and methodologies. So, for instance, again, in graphic design, uh, the initial you know uh, scoping of a uh, of a task uh, could establish that um, you know we want to work on an infographic, but then during the course uh, uh, during the course of the of the project, uh, it may emerge that for the certain segments of, of the market, actually, a short two minute video. Uh, may be best. Because we have that live interaction, because it's not simply a turnkey project which, where you send an email and expect a response after two weeks, uh, uh, BrainShoring offers the capability and flexibility to adapt uh, to that new format. And just to jump on this one uh, on the on the range of tools and methodologies, I think that's something that, that might seem silly, but it's very different. What we often see with some of our clients is, is that uh, they would go with providers that are specialized. I am a market research company, so I'm going to do uh, interviews with customers. Uh, and then, you know, tell me what your question was, by the way. 
on the contrary, when you're in a, a brain sharing approach, what you need to do is to say, what is your problem? And I need to be able to offer you a full range of approaches uh, to solve your problem. So I need to be able to do desk research, uh, primary research, use technology and so on. When it comes to research, or when it comes to design, I need to be able to do PowerPoint and infographics and PDFs and uh, videos and so on. So that requires the brain sharing providers to be very versatile in, in how they do their work. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when we're doing research is by definition, we're going into, we're trying to find new information and to produce new insights. So we need to have, so having that flexibility to change the approach, for instance, if we're looking for financials for a certain company and we find that they're not publicly available uh, with brain shoring, we're not just going to tell the client, sorry, this is not available. Brain shoring will uh, try all full range. So we can like call uh, call the company up and, uh, and ask uh, and ask for that type of information or access different databases, et cetera. So that, uh, that's really a, a core core strength uh, for um, uh, for the brain uh, for brain sharing. And uh, so then that finally uh, leads us to to delivery. Eventually we do <laughs> we, uh, we we do uh, finish our tasks, of course. Um, and uh, so the, the first thing, of course, as with all uh, uh, um, outsourcing, quality is, needs to be the bedrock of, um, uh, of our business. If obviously this goes with, with any business, really, I mean, if quality isn't there, uh, then we cannot build that trusting relationship that is crucial for the brain shoring approach. Um, then, but on top of that, again, it's not just about making sure that we tick the boxes that we agreed to with the client. What's really important to us is to make sure that the work that has been done so far addresses the question and has resolved uh, the problem that, uh, that the client has posed. And until that occurs, we won't consider a, uh, a project uh, concluded um, because it, it if it remains an open question. And then, uh, there's the added value of that uh, long-lasting uh, established relationship between the client and the provider, which allows the, the provider to basically build a level of expertise customized to that specific client. So uh, once a project is concluded, the, uh, the provider can anticipate further questions that may have come up uh, during, the, uh, during that task, or it may be, may be even able to tie the findings from a certain task to uh, to another one within within the same team, and so basically it builds uh, it gives us the uh, opportunity to build on valuable uh, next uh, next steps and to always bring uh, you know answer more detailed questions and provide always more value uh, to uh, to the work that is being done. On on this one on the on the next steps it might seem again uh, um, uh, minor, but the ability to add value generally stems from the next step. The initial ask for clients is often quite narrow and structured, but then at the second stage, then you get the opportunity to be more creative, to do things that are more out of the box and to get that icing on the cake that normally you wouldn't do because you're transactional, you're supposed to execute because you were got a request by email. Here, you would send your deliverable, place a call to the client say, I found this, but I have a doubt about that information. I would suggest that we call three, four experts in the industry, or, you know, I made your presentation, a PowerPoint, but you know what? We have amazing illustrators and I'd love to create a, an illustration that covers all the content in one, in one go in something. And it's where it becomes more interesting for the client, but also for the <clears throat> people working at the brain showing company, you can, they, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, because they can direct the work to what they're good at, what they enjoy doing and so on. And that's something where we, you need to be encouraged to do as much as possible. And if I just may add uh, one last thing, uh, like if you go back to, to that example of that internal m and uh, uh, strategy uh, proposal, uh, imagine like normally with, with other, with, you know, regular providers, you, you know, that task is done and you never hear from them again or from that specific analyst, but within brainshoring, that analyst will keep, will uh, keep an ear out for those uh, uh, for that topic, and if something comes up, it's no problem to send an email or even often uh, call the client directly because uh, we establish that type of personal relationship to provide uh, constant updates and explore opportunities for further uh, cooperation and, um, and and creating more value. So, uh, so that's that's the the three step approach.
So uh, uh, going into the geographies, uh, as uh, Martin uh, explained, one of the uh, driving uh, forces that led to the uh, emergence of brainshoring is the virtual office. However, this does not mean that brainstorming can be done anywhere. In fact, uh, geography and where a uh, brainstorming operation is set up is very important, in fact. So um, as many of you may know, there, may, uh, there are like three conventional ways of, of understanding outsourcing. Um, one is onshore. So uh, onshore is when the um, provider is in the same country or same uh, geography as, a, as the client. This has the advantage of having a very easy, obviously, a uh, live client interaction. However, this often comes with high cost when we look at uh, the markets that are regularly uh, targeted, uh, such as North America and Europe, especially. Um, then on the other end of the spectrum, we have far shoring, which is when instead, and I think that's more when we think of like outsourcing for manufacturing, for instance. So um, the um, uh, the, the provider is not in the same uh, regional uh, proximity of, of the client. And so that live interaction is, becomes almost uh, practically impossible. However, it presents the advantage of having very low costs. Nearshoring, of course, is the Goldilocks solution. It's uh, in between. So it's uh, basically placing providers in proximity of the uh, client markets. So, uh, so we, having that advantage for that easy live interaction through various platforms such as uh, Zoom, Teams, um, chat, Google Chat, uh, and all of that. Uh, but also in certain geographies also presents the advantage of having lower costs. Now, uh, when we're talking about brain shoring, the first, um, the first driver for choosing a location has to be the quality of talent. Again, brain shoring does not work if you don't have quality people with those soft, uh, with those soft uh, skills that uh, that Martin described previously, it just won't work if you don't have people that are uh, uh, knowledgeable, that are fast learners, that uh, are uh, creative and critical thinkers, uh, and those uh, are normally associated with countries that have strong public education uh, programs. Uh, then the second criteria for choosing a location has to be the availability of talent. Now, this is different from the cost of talent. Availability of talent means that you have access to the talent pool. And this is one reason why uh, nearshoring, for instance, uh, is a better solution often than onshoring, because onshoring has a high, uh, onshoring solutions, for instance, in Europe uh, would uh, imply high, um, uh, competitive, uh, high competitiveness from a, a human resources perspective, which also translates in a high turnover rate, which is not ideal for brain shoring because we have to establish, we have to be able to establish uh, those long-term relationships uh, with uh, with our clients. And then, of course, uh, uh, I've explained this already is the proximity to key markets. We have to be able within the we have to be within the same time zone as our clients, so we can basically lock on to their uh, working time uh, um, working schedule. Um, Less important criteria, as I mentioned, cost. Um, Brainstorming is not, a, we don't think of it as a cost saving operation. Um, it has to be a fair, uh, it has to be a cost that is fair, but not uh, uh, one that is driving the decision for clients to uh, rely on brainstorming. Uh, other uh, issues like stability of the political stability of the country are relatively important. Uh, because brainstorming normally does not imply um, high capital investments, some level of political instability can be tolerated, obviously within reason, uh, it, uh, but ultimately it has to be a safe place for people to work, uh, basically. So uh, do, do you have anything to add on this, uh, on this point, Martin? No, no, I think it's, it's the, the, the criteria are in different order versus typical offshoring operations. Yeah. In most offshoring operations, in, uh, specifically in KPO, for example, knowledge process outsourcing, the criteria are not, are not the same. Cost comes as number one. And in, in brain showing, you always prefer to pay 10, 20% higher because you have higher quality talent and the talent is available and you don't have that much competition. And, 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 and that, that is the main, uh, the main factor. It's about delivering value and not only saving costs. And, and that's the, I think the whole, the whole concept. And that's why we believe it's a different industry to KPO because KPO is mostly about cost saving. 
exactly, exactly. It's all about uh, delivering uh, that expertise. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, if we take that criteria into consideration, we can already uh, divide the world roughly into three areas, uh, which is uh, basically, uh, firstly defined simply by the time zone. So for instance, uh, going uh, west to east, if uh, we can see that there's a, an American market, uh, normally, of course, the target market will be mostly the North American one. And we identified three geographies uh, where that are very promising for grain shoring operations, uh, being uh, those being Mexico, Colombia, and Costa Rica. Um, and in fact, in Costa Rica, McKinsey even has a set up uh, some uh, uh, offshore operations there, uh, taking advantage of the availability of talent, thanks to their uh, uh, excellent university programs that are producing uh, highly educated people. And of course, Infominio has recently opened an office in, uh, in Mexico City. Um, then uh, moving to Europe and EMEA, in fact, um, you know, basically that uh, section that goes from um, on the map from, we can say Iran to uh, Portugal, it serves two distinct or rather three distinct markets, uh, the uh, European one, the uh, Gulf states, and also uh, African markets. And within here, the primary locations, of course, are Morocco and Egypt, uh, then uh, uh, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, uh, Poland, and uh, Romania, also within Europe, are, um, are, excellent, are excellent locations to serve the uh, European market, also because of the language, obviously, uh, lower language barriers. However, the uh, advantage of uh, range showing locations in Northern Africa and Middle East is that obviously they can easily just as well serve the uh, Gulf country states uh, as uh, obviously Arabic is not an issue. Uh, and then uh, for Asia, the, it's a bit different because the target market uh, uh, obviously being um, China uh, is also a, a, a location. So it's one of those rare instances where the onshoring actually could be a good location for brain shoring for serving that market, also in light of the language barrier uh, issue. But uh, other locations are these uh, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, um, and the Philippines are also great for serving the wider uh, Asia Pacific region. Uh, region. Uh, including target markets such as Australia and Japan. So we see already that just by applying this criteria, we already start to understand that uh, brain shoring basically maps itself out. Um, yeah. Yep. Thank you, Lorenzo. Just one point on Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, on Asia, it's it's atypical. I mean, there's today the, the biggest uh, market for the similar services to what the brain shoring does is India. Uh, it's a good platform, but really far shore. Most of people in India work for clients in Europe and the US. So if you want to get a brain shoring operation, it's much less relevant than it used to be for other services. One country that is interesting is Malaysia, uh, where in Malaysia, you have quite a lot of people that do speak Chinese, uh, but also the language is close to Indonesian and so on. So Malaysia seems to be a promising uh, a brain shoring operation for, for AVAC. Okay. So let me move on to the last uh, section and then we'll done, be done with the presentation and I'm more than welcome to take your, your question in the, in the Q&A. Um, so what is the value of brain shoring? Why do we do all of that? Um, so first of all, for its clients, how does brain shoring create value? Somehow it's looping the loop with the initial uh, four uh, tendencies that we, uh, we identified. One, it expands the access to the talent pool. You will have seen in the press in the last few weeks, so many companies complaining around access to talent. It's impossible to hire. I don't have the right people. So what these companies want to do is to focus the people they hired on where they add the most value. And they want to expand the talent pool. So today, when you're a company, you think about, okay, where is my corporate office? People need to live within 20 kilometers, 100 kilometers from that place. And now that you have more of these... Uh, you know, work from home policies, maybe in the same country, but, you know, many of the clients working, for example, with InfoMine, you would never have thought about having 10, 20, 30 people in Cairo or in Casablanca. And essentially, uh, brain showing companies give access to their clients to talent pools they would not have tapped into otherwise. Second is, you know, there are things you're good at, things you're not so good at. And the brain showing uh, company will work with multiple clients on similar topics. They will learn from all their clients. And in some cases, they will be stronger and better than their clients 
to the same extent, again, to take that same example, Foxconn is probably much better than Apple at manufacturing phones. They have more expertise. And that's probably the case as well in services. So you will benefit from the expertise of the supplier. And finally, linked to the, uh, to the first one, so you have access to a broader talent pool that allows you to focus your own talent, people that are on your payroll, on where you have a competitive edge. If you take the example of a consulting firm, for example, today in most consultancies, for example, if you take the big four, a consultant is supposed to do spend time with their clients, do research, do analysis, make their own presentations, and so on and so forth. And it's very hard to do. And given most consulting firms are stretched now in terms of capacity, how about they focus their consultants on as much of client-facing time while relying on brain-showing providers to outsource some of the support activities like research, translation, design, potentially more. And that's exactly that idea that they want to focus on where they have a competitive edge. And interestingly, in the consulting field, the most advanced, I would say, the most prestigious, that charge the most of their clients have made that move um, uh, quite a lot already to, to focus their consultants and the others are, are, are following. So that's the value for the clients. And finally, what is the value for society? Uh, you know, what motivates us as InfoMinu and why do we do that effort on brain shoring? Um, it's because I truly believe there is societal value. Um, there is societal value in, in brain shoring uh, for multiple things. First of all, it's a reverse brain drain. Instead of having the elite of a country, if they want to get intellectually challenging jobs, having to move away from their countries, on the contrary, they can stay put with, close to their families and so on and learn so much and bring in new skills and new competencies. Um, today, I'm really, really proud of obviously the team that we have at InfoMenu, but also what our alumni have done. They are now in a lot of local companies, they work with government and so on, and they transfer those skills within, uh, within society. And that's a link to 2.2. It creates a local pool of high high quality professionals. So high quality from a skills perspective, but also when you're working in international operations, the standards that you have from a, a ethical standpoint, from a gender a diversity tolerance and and so on, also are are, are different, and you can influence the local economy uh, uh, in that way. Third, uh, and that's why I think the doing business is not that important is essentially you spend locally, but you earned uh, as an export market. So the invoices will be sent to France, Germany, and the US, and you will spend locally. So it gets fresh cash into the countries in which you operate. And many of these countries need cash to be able to fuel their economies. And finally, it's, it's attracting investments. It puts these countries on the map by doing those operations with number of clients. They start to realize that these countries are a great platform for doing business that you can uh, invest there and, and have you know, a meaningful operation. So it's, it, stimulates, uh, it stimulates investments. So that's, that's, that's all for me. Um, just to, to, to conclude, um, what are the next steps? Um, First of all, you see that something very new that is just emerging. What we want to do is to continue the thinking process about it. Be more exhaustive as to understanding which services could be uh, eligible to brain shoring. Uh, uh, what geographies are the best and really have a ranking of these geographies. So there's some thinking to be, to be put. Second is brain shoring has been initiated by InfoMinu because we're thinking this way, but it is, we don't, it doesn't belong to us, quite the contrary. We want to put it out there and give it away to, uh, to the general public and to other companies. I'd love many other companies to say, oh, this is me. I didn't know I was doing brain showing, but actually that's what I do. I don't do BPO, I don't do KPO, I do brain showing. So let me recognize myself, myself in that concept and therefore expand uh, the, the, the industry. And then there is an element around the, the concept. Now you're, you're the happy few that know about it the first, but ideally we'd want uh, to be on Wikipedia. We'd want the press to relay that concept so that it becomes a new industry. So that's, uh, that's it for the presentation. Thank you very much for attending it. So now we can go to, to, uh, to Q and A and, and take your, your questions. So uh, feel free to, uh, to, to send your questions. Um, yeah, we I can the, start. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. first question, Martin, actually, we have is um, how did you come up 
with brain shoring? Like, was it, did you intend to create a, to create brain shoring or did it grow organically, you know, with the business and uh, how, how did this concept develop? Um, that's a very good question, uh, Lorenzo. I think uh, um, our clients kept telling us that what we were doing was different. Initially, we, we thought that what InfoManu was doing was uh, KPO, knowledge process outsourcing, but we were significantly more expensive than competition. And still, our clients were working more and more with us. We we're winning market share. And our clients said, you know, guys, you're different. You're not doing the same thing as the other companies we work with. You're not replacing them, but you're different. And we started thinking about it and figured that, yes, because we were doing intake execution, because we were having nearshoring operations, because all these factors, we figured it was uh, a, different, uh, a different industry. So I would say mostly our clients starting telling us, and then we realized that it was true and there was something new that was coming up to, you know, when you think about uh, offshoring, starting with BPO, and then we say, yeah, BPO covers only part of it. Then st some guys started with KPO, knowledge process outsourcing, and now it's the next evolution. And, and we feel that that it's there's something uh, that is something new. And by the way, I also saw a question on on where the word comes from. Uh, obviously, you you see shoring and brain, uh, so it's. As simple as that, shoring is the idea that you don't need to do things yourself, you can outsource and brain because what you value is not a process. What I don't like in KPO, it's knowledge process outsourcing. It means that you have to be able to codify the tasks. We don't think about process, we think about approach, about solution, about attitudes, and what it requires is brain. So you don't outsource muscle, but you outsource brain. And that's where the brain, the, the word comes from. Exactly. Um, another uh, preoccupation that someone may have like uh, seeing the, this type of process is that, okay, the advantage with uh, outsourcing is that it's that, right? I, I give that task to someone else. I don't have to think about it until I, I receive it. With brainstorming instead, it sounds like I, have to, I still have to invest time with, um, uh, with certain tasks or projects. Like how, how would you address the, that type of uh, concern? So can you rephrase it, please, Lorenzo? I'm not sure I got your question. Sure. So, so that with uh, other forms of outsourcing, KPO is like their turnkey projects where basically, you know, do a, a benchmark study on, you know, X number of companies and I won't hear from, uh, from you for the next few days until, you, uh, you know, I receive it back. And it, so I put it out of mind. With brainstorming instead, we have this, you know, uh, uh, this interaction, this even, which involves obviously a time investment on the part of, on the, part of the client. And so how would you address that concern uh, that some clients may have that, okay, so this is a new service, but it still requires time investment for me? I think there's two elements. One, you will access capabilities that you don't necessarily have. So yes, it will take some of your time, but it will, done, it will be done better than if you do it yourself. Think about, I don't know, I was a consultant BCG before and I was doing presentations. I was super slow at it and my sense of aesthetics is a disaster. And I could have spent two hours doing it myself, but if I spent two hours briefing somebody that could do it instead of me, they would do it a hundred times better. And there was already worthwhile investment of my time. Uh, the second element is when you outsource, it's not that you're gonna go from a hundred percent of your time to zero percent. You're gonna go from a hundred to 10, 15, 20%. This 10, 15, 20% creates a lot of value. So if your aim is to go from 100 to zero, then it's gonna be very difficult to have a good service. So it's not getting to zero, but it's saving you a lot of time. And you know, picking up the phone to spend 10 minutes, everybody has 10 minutes. And if a client tells you they don't have 10 minutes in a day to brief you, it means that what they have asked you is not important enough. So I think it's, it, it works quite well, but yes, the clients need to dedicate a little, a little time. Sorry for the, the bad word, but it's garbage in, garbage out. If you don't invest in a clear brief and in answering questions, what you get in the end, regardless of the quality of the supplier with whom you work, is not going to be great. So when uh, you're, uh, you, uh, you describe the next steps in brain shoring that, uh, that you see it growing as a concept uh, uh, beyond, uh, obviously, its current footprint, what other services do you think are... Um, are um, fertile for uh, for brainstorming in the future. 
that's that's a great question, Lorenzo. To be fair, that's probably the area where we are the least advanced in the thinking. We know the characteristics of brain sharing services that require proximity, critical thinking, interaction with client, good communication, and so on. And from there, you can define. So clearly, in, in professional services, where it's the core business info, info menu, research, uh, um, analytics, design, language services are four that we have identified and started. But then there are other things. Think about legal services. When you're a lawyer, you need to write your contracts. Do you need to be in Milan or in Paris or London to write a contract? No, not necessarily. You can explain to somebody this. So in the legal services, I think there are things to do. I think in science, there are other things to do. You know, this experimentation, this discovery, and so on. These are things that could be uh, part of, of brain shoring. Uh, but, but this is an occasion to make a call, you know, from people on this, uh, on this webinar and beyond. If you have ideas of services that could fit the definition that recognize themselves as brain shoring, um, I'd love to hear about you. Uh, that's, uh, that would be very, uh, very interesting. Uh, we have uh, another more personal question to us. Um, what does infominio mean? Uh, where does the word come from? Okay, it's another thing I'm most uh, proud about that information, anything around information, because initially we started mostly with research and my, my neo was mining research, going deep in things. So I grouped the two, put an end that seems Latin, that it seems smarter, and then it gives you <laughs> info my new. But the main criteria for info my new was, did it exist in .com or not? And I tried a hundred uh, without a .com before, before coming to info my new. Uh, we have another question on geographies. Uh, so uh, regarding uh, the brain showing potential geographies, can you, clean can you please explain why, for example, Tunisia or Algeria are not considered as brain showing geographies, knowing that Tunisia, for example, has almost the same characteristics <coughs> of, uh, of those as Morocco? Um, like, uh, how, is that, uh, how are those considerations made? No, that's, that's, a, that's a good question as well. Um, so here we, we don't pretend to have a definitive list of the uh, location. It's probably more of a ranking than, than something else. Um, when you think about Morocco versus Tunisia and Algeria, Algeria is a country where it's quite difficult to operate. Most people would confirm that it's difficult to set up a business and so on. And, and the reputation of the education system in Algeria is not uh, outstanding, especially when it comes to the level of English, uh, which is not necessarily very good. Morocco has made a, a, a strong move into getting more English speaking education. Uh, and, and in brain showing, you need to speak English plus other languages, but in English is a must uh, every time. Uh, when it comes to Tunisia, the difference with Morocco is mostly the fact that it's a little less scalable. It's a smaller country. Uh, it's roughly a third of the size of, of Morocco. So you want to be in a country where you can hire dozens, hundreds of people, uh, but Tunisia is probably quite, quite a good location. But then when you have a choice, you probably prefer Morocco over Tunisia. The, market, the, the, the country which is not in that list is Egypt. Um, Egypt is quite an amazing market for, for that. The quality of education of the top education is really outstanding. People all speak very good English and the Arabic that is spoken in Egypt is very adaptable to, to the Gulf. And one of the intangible element of a choice would be it's the biggest movie industry in the region. So everybody in the Gulf region or in MENA would understand Egyptian Arabic. They would not necessarily understand Tunisian or Moroccan Arabic. Um, so it makes the country quite versatile. In, in our Egypt operations, we work with Europe as well as with the GCC. Um, whereas in Morocco, it's more difficult to work with the GCC for time difference, for uh, uh, for uh, we work week uh, reasons as well. Okay. Um, we don't have any other questions in the in the queue. Maybe one that I have just to top it off is that um, there's a lot of talk about AI displacing the services industry. How would how do you think that would affect uh, the brain shoring uh, op uh, operations, or would it would it be be affected by it? Um, that, that's uh, that's interesting. So essentially, when you think about basic tasks, 
do you think that automation and computers and AI will replace you? Your call center, if you, I was to lead a call center operation or BPO operations, I would be quite worried uh, because the task can be automated. There's a process, so a machine can learn a process. In brain training, what we're trying to do is to do the things where the machine cannot yet replace a human being, can be creative, can interact, empathize with people and, and, and so on. Uh, so we are on, on the edge of the services where the human cannot be replaced, but we have that challenge of always keeping up in terms of the level of value add. We use technology, but we are the humans that control the technology to the same extent as, you know, when you were in an industry where machines came in, you know, you were, I don't know, in the, in the garment industry, does it kill all the jobs? No, you now have machine operators, but if you have people suing manually, they will be replaced to the same extent as BPO, potentially KPO will be replaced by AI. Brain sharing has to be the people that control the machines. And that's what we do. So typically we are going to launch uh, analytics. So analytics will be very heavy on technology, but it will use technology to do analysis, but the, the, the machine will not be telling you what it means for you. What is the insights? How do you need to think differently? Because the machine has a hard time thinking about the difference and thinking about the innovation. So that's, that's where we believe that it's, uh, it's people in KPO or BPO need to increase their level of value add and the reliance on training, on critical thinking to be able to, uh, to resist uh, the, the AI wave. All right. I think we went a little over <laughs> uh, uh, our intended, but I think we, uh, those were all interesting points, I think. Um, Great. So let's uh, let's close. Thank you, Lorenzo, uh, for uh, for being here and helping on all those concepts. Thank you, Kenza, for the organization. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We hope we you found that interesting. We'd be very very happy to continue that conversation offline. If you have any questions, if you want to engage, if you recognize yourself in the concept, uh, then uh, you're more than welcome to uh, to to engage with us. Um, and we will release the brain showing white paper that we've written in the next few hours. So you can read in a little more details what we explained today on this on this webinar. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, just so one last thing. Uh, we will, uh, as you said, release the white paper very soon, but also the recording of this webinar will be also available. So make sure to follow us on uh, social media, mainly on uh, LinkedIn. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.